and welcome to all our viewers. My name is Maratlin Vidya, and I'm an occupational therapist working at Play Street Bangalore, India. Play Street is an organization that provides educational services to help children with special needs become independent and live up to their potential. We offer parent empowerment programs and integrated schooling programs and a variety of clinical services. In recognition of Autism Awareness and Acceptance Month, our focus is firmly set on the profound significance of dyspraxia. We aim for this series to shed light on the complexities of dyspraxia, address the specific hurdles people with dyspraxia face, and raise awareness about its importance within the neurodiversity world. Today we are on the second talk of our series, which falls under the segment that focuses on Unraveling Dyspraxia, Exploring Connections with the Autism and the Brain. The topic for today is Navigating Autism and Dyspraxia, Understanding the Connection and Challenges. And we are very honored to have Dr. Sunita Rege with us to share her valuable thoughts and information on this theme. I'm so happy to be here. It's uh, the first time I think I'm talking to uh, Miraclin and uh, play uh, for after a really long time talking to you, Miraclin. So yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me for this uh, conversation. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Suvita Rehe is an associate professor and head of the Department of Occupational Therapy, MCHP Manipal. She completed her doctoral studies from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill in 2014. And after returning to India, has been working in Manipal since 2015. She primarily works with families and children with special needs with a focus on their health, well-being, and ability to participate as resilient members of the communities that they live in. She has worked with children with autism and their families in different settings, including schools, private clinics, and community settings. She has been involved in research activities related to participation of children. Currently, she is a member of the review board of national and international journals. She is also a member of the Institutional Research Committee at MCHP. I am privileged to have pursued my master's degree under her esteemed guidance. Dr. Sumita, we are very grateful to that you have taken time out of your schedule to share your knowledge about dyspraxia and autism. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction, Mirakin. <laughs> that seems like a lot, but uh, yeah, thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Uh, before we go on to the questions, is there something that you would like to share? Any thoughts to our viewers? Mm -hmm. So I honestly feel this is a really important topic, uh, dyspraxia and autism, because generally people think about these two as being very, very distinct disorders. And the fact that they could co-occur is something which not a lot of people think about. It, it seems inconceivable that somebody with a motor planning impairment and somebody with a communication impairment, they go together. But many times what we see in practice is that many of the children that we work with who are diagnosed with autism tend to have a lot of difficulties with performing their daily activities. Uh, just last week, actually, one of the parents spoke about this and she said, it feels like every day I have to teach my son a new task. It's the same task of brushing, but every day he seems to find it new and different. He just doesn't seem to get it. And to me, that sort of actually uh, very clearly hits the nail about what dyspraxia is. And then given the whole communication issues that children with autism have, they're actually just unable to tell us what is happening with them. And so I'm really glad that you all have picked this topic for your summit this year. Thank you so much, ma'am. I think you've given like a gist of what we are about to go on also. Mm -hmm. So without much further ado, let's like, get to the questions. Yeah. All right. So um, I'm like, as you gave the introduction, so how does uh, dyspraxia and autism intersect? Like, is there some like, key differences that help us distinguish between dyspraxia and autism? Okay, so I'll take a step back and uh, start off by telling you that there are uh, definite differences in the way that dyspraxia and autism happen. The etiology is different, the diagnostic criteria is different. Uh, things are different. The only thing that they both come under is the idea of neurodevelopmental disorder. So dyspraxia can occur without autism, autism can occur in isolation, but most of the times you see that uh, these conditions co-occur with some or the other uh, other conditions. It could be ADHD, it could be uh, 
ID, it could be multiple other. But when the two intersect, the way that the problems are evident become very different. So I think when I was studying, which is a really long time ago, uh, we were actually made to believe that children with autism cannot have any sort of a motor issue. Uh, yet we kept coming across people with autism who had difficulty in achieving their motor milestones. Uh, now that I think about it in hindsight, when you reflect back, it seems as if many of them were not diagnosed with the issue that they had, which was dyspraxia. Because with dyspraxia, it became difficult for them to figure out how to develop the skill. And when they couldn't develop the skill, then further problems started to happen. So in that way, there's a lot of overlap between dyspraxia and autism. Both of them have etiologies which are not very clearly defined. They know We know there is something off in the brain. We just don't know what circuits are affected, how they are affected. And there's a lot of research going on about that. Uh, many children with autism are thought to have, a, like if they have autism with dyspraxia, they're thought to have some affectation in the cerebellum, which leads to further connection problems and those cause the difficulties that they have. But most of the difficulties that you will see with autism will be mainly about communication and interpersonal relationship, things like that. With, with dyspraxia, they're more about motor planning. But at the end of the day, a child needs to do things. They need to be able to do their ADL as we call them, eating, dressing, grooming, bathing, toileting. But they also need to do other things like play, study. And given that this is India, we, are, we have parents who are very, very keen on the studying aspect more than the others. And when children start to have problems with these, that is when the dyspraxia becomes evident. So dyspraxia may happen if there is an issue with uh, just being able to plan. Autism will happen if there is an issue with being able to communicate. Now put the two together and the problems become multiple. That's where I see the intersection. I'm also a little prone to telling stories about patients that I've seen, so you might end up with a lot of examples from me. And that's, that's the best way you can explain. Yeah. Um, thank you for really explaining it. Uh, also, if spoken about how they overlap and how they intersect. Uh, I wanted to know if there is any specific challenges or any specific characteristics uh, that children with dyspraxia have that might be mistaken to be features of autism. So children with dyspraxia tend to have, like I said, and since I'm an occupational therapist, uh, I obviously look at things from what children can do and how they can participate rather than just looking at the skills. So a lot of times I find that children who, actually I find it the other way, children who have uh, autism get diagnosed with dyspraxia and dyspraxia with autism. That can happen. Uh, where people think about the fact that since a child is not imitating gestures, so being able to imitate gestures is a huge part of communication. Not being able to imitate gestures becomes a part of the autism spectrum because they have social communication issues. But there are also issues similar to that with dyspraxia where they can't imitate. So if I tell a child, uh, let's let's give, give me a high five like this, and the child doesn't figure out what I'm asking them to do, or they can't figure out how to plan it, then those sort of issues tend to build up. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Yes, ma'am, that does. <laughs> Uh, also, ma'am, so now that we've um, uh, taken away the challenges or the mistakes that can happen while diagnosing, uh, what about the instances where individuals get diagnosed with both dyspraxia and autism? So how does this dual diagnosis uh, impact their experiences when compared to somebody who's just uh, diagnosed with autism or just diagnosed with dyspraxia? So that gets me back to a story. <laughs> this is actually a child that I worked with. And uh, at that time, I was still just learning about dyspraxia and autism. Uh, but what was very interesting to see with her was, and this is a girl that I was working with who had autism, was she's a high-functioning child who was going to a regular school. Uh, seemed to be able to understand everything. But asking her to perform was the challenge. So when we were working with her on develop, making sure that she had adequate play skills, and we started actually to do a game with her on uh, 
have you ever played uh, it's called we used to call it ice cream soda it's the one of those games yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, she had friends who would play that game and she really wanted to be with them and play that game but every time we tried telling her this is up this is down this is what we do she would just end up getting so frustrated and then end up having a meltdown when she's unable to express to us the fact that she's not able to actually figure out up down and being able to coordinate all of those movements at the same time so like every OT, we decided let's do activity analysis, break down the task and do it. And when we broke down the task, it was possible for her to do it. When she wrote, learn the task, it was possible for her to do it. She was very happy. She went to school one day and told a friend of hers, I'm going to play this game with you. And they changed the song. Okay. It's the same game. They changed the song and then she was all lost and it was a really bad experience for her whole issue that she was having was the fact that motor planning was the problem. And because she couldn't plan and she couldn't communicate, it became really difficult for her to actually tell people what she wanted and then to do it. This led to her being isolated because most of her friends, they're all six, seven years of age. They kept thinking, okay, this is the girl who's forever crying. I don't think I want to pay that much attention to her. I don't want to play with her. And then she was starting to get isolated. The problem was with motor planning. The problem is with communication. But everything else started to get affected. In fact, her self-esteem became really low. And um, it's still challenging for her. But uh, yeah, that, that is the way things go. Thank you so much, Ram. That was so much easier to understand when you gave the example. Uh, also, Ram, so there are stereotypical movements that we see in autism. And there are motor planning, motor coordination difficulties that we see in this class. Yeah. So when uh, those two come together, so how will this, the motor planning difficulties different from a stereotypic movement or stimming that we see with children in autism? So from behavior therapy, there is this concept that I really like. It helps me to explain a lot of things. I'm just going to share that with you. It's the ABC principle. Hmm. Antecedent behavior of consequence. So whenever there is a behavior, there has to be a reason for that behavior. And whatever happens after that is what will ensure that the behavior is carried on or it will say the behavior is not going to happen. For a child on the autism spectrum, then they are participating in stereotypical play. Sometimes it is because they are trying to, uh, sometimes it could be because they don't know how else to do it. When they line up the cars and things like that, they only know how to do that. That gives them an order, a sequence, and a way to organize things. And that's how they organize their brain. So that could be one of the reasons why they're doing it. Another reason could be that they have never learned how to play with someone else because of their social communication issues. And the third one could be the very simple thing that they don't know how to plan, how to organize, how to move the car from here to there, which goes back to your taxi. Now, unless I know what is causing this stereotypical behavior, there is no way that I can figure out what to do with it later. So as a therapist, I started very recently, actually, to be very careful when I see a child who is uh, participating in very stereotypical play. I started to work on trying to identify why this is happening and giving this child multiple opportunities to see how to change it. So we... We started to do a lot more motor planning assessments if a child is only playing in a particular way because we want to figure out what is happening. And as a result of that, we are able to figure out what is the consequence. So sometimes children will want to sit in one place and parents are also happy to let them sit in one place and play the same game because at least the child is not crying, at least he's not having a temper that and he seems to be happy. If that is the case, it is reinforcing this child's behavior. So we need to figure out what is causing the whole chain and then work with that accordingly. Sometimes children just want that as something to organize because the world outside them is seeming to be so chaotic. They need some order, some sequence, some structure. So we let them play that way and then try to introduce a few differences and see how they are managed. If they're able to transition, then we know it might not be a motor planning issue. It could just be an issue with how they are feeling at this point in time. So depending on those things, uh, you can take it from there. But you really need to figure out why it's happening before it happens. Okay, thank you so much. Um, 
And also, uh, so we have uh, sensory processing uh, problems and difficulties. So when it is uh, dyspraxia, there are uh, experts who say that in dyspraxia, it is more to do with sensory processing, whereas in autism, it's more to do with sensory modulation. So when it comes to uh, like dyspraxia and autism together, so how does these two impact in a child who has both diagnoses? Sensory processing is the common issue, like you said uh, very clearly. Sensory processing is the common issue for children with autism and dyspraxia. Uh, while we are considering children at the autism spectrum to be on the lower side of the sensory integration issues and having more modulation issues, it need not be the case. Many times children with dyslexia also have modulation issues. Children with autism may also have discrimination issues, which is known to be common with dyslexia. So unless we do a complete assessment of the whole situation, we are not going to be able to pick it up. Uh, I think last time when I was explaining dyslexia to a group of uh, BOT students, it was very interesting to hear from them about how uh, one of them actually spoke about the fact that she thinks she has dyslexia. And uh, so she's an adult who says that I think now when I'm listening to this whole thing, I think I have dyslexia. And she spoke about how she found it difficult to discriminate between uh, things around and space and things like that. This is very typical, very common in children with dyspraxia, where they're unable to discriminate uh, sensation. For instance, when uh, we are, do you drive, Miracle? Yeah, two-wheeler. Yeah, when you drive a two-wheeler, it's easier, but when you're driving a four-wheeler, when you're sitting behind and you have to figure out the space, yeah. that whole idea of depth perception becomes an issue. And perception as such would be related to sensory discrimination itself, yeah. which is known to be a problem with or children who have dyspraxia. Okay. Whereas children on the autism spectrum are thought to have, like you said, more modulation issues, okay. uh, where they are unable to regulate themselves in response to sensory input that they are getting. Now you put the two together, full blown mix, where yeah. everything is happening at the same time. So a child is unable to figure out how to modulate themselves in response to a stimulus. And then they are unable to figure out whether the stimulus itself is dangerous to them or not. So that causes a lot more problems and it's a tricky situation to handle uh, using the sensory integration approach, but that seems to be the best approach to handle both these situations because the problem is right there. Okay. And also uh, social and communication challenge, which is one of the main challenges in children with autism. So how does that, uh, or how is it very distinct with those um, who those individuals or children who have dyspraxia and do they do children with dyspraxia also have social and communication issues or is it just for children with autism and autism with dyspraxia so how to go on so uh, dyspraxia generally is about being able to plan being able to plan also is uh, related to speech for instance if i want to tell you a story and i tell you the end of the story before the beginning that's going to be a problem. And that is still a planning issue. How do we plan? How do we execute what we are saying? And that is one of the issues that a child with dyspraxia is going to have. So in that sense, they may also have communication-related issues. But the communication issues that a child on the autism spectrum has are very different. It is because they are unable to express themselves in any way that makes maybe makes sense to somebody else. So they are expressing themselves, but you may not be able to figure out what they are expressing. And uh, this is an example I give very uh, commonly, actually. It's uh, one of the children that I work with. He doesn't have dyspraxia. He has only autism. Uh, but he has a lot of difficulty with expressing himself. And uh, initially, when he started to come for therapy, the only way that he would actually express himself was by eating. So we had a PG student who was working with him. And every time this boy came in, she got hit. And one day when we, I was taking the session for him because the student was not there, so I was working with him. I was anticipating getting hit and pulled and pinched and everything. The session went really smooth. It was really smooth, no hitting, no tantrums, nothing. And it's not because I'm a good therapist. What I realized is because the therapist who was working with him was the one he trusted. So when she could not figure out his communication, he got frustrated. And then it would be like, how dare you not figure out what I'm saying? Whereas with me, it was, okay, you're never going to understand what I'm trying to say. I'm just going to give up on you. 
But this ability to be able to plan how to communicate is something that he had. It's not something which was missing in the diagnosis of autism. If you add the component of dyspraxia theater, then being able to even communicate is a challenge. So both of them will have different types of communication issues. Both will may have communication issues. Children with dyspraxia may be able to actually tell you a lot of things, but they are unable to do things. Uh, one of the earliest uh, examples I know for a child with dyspraxia is uh, a child I was working with, his name, he's diagnosed with dyspraxia, and uh, we used to spend almost uh, 45 to 50 minute sessions by listening to stories that he would tell us. So anything you told him, you told him, listen, uh, we are going to try this obstacle course, and then we got a whole story about why this is for babies, why he's a big boy, why he doesn't need these sort of things. So we got a whole explanation but really not actually articulating the fact that he could not do the task, and which is why he didn't want to do it. So he's communicating, but not doing a good job of that communication. On the other hand, a child with autism may also have difficulty with communication, but they definitely want to communicate. One of the things that I've learned uh, through practice is this whole myth of the fact that children on the autism spectrum don't want to interact, don't want to be with people, don't want to play. That's not true, they do. They just don't know how to do it. And this not knowing how to do it could partially come from the dyspraxia that they're facing. So it becomes really important to be looking at this whole thing together to ensure that we are coming up with solutions which fit them in all ways. So now we've been uh, talking about individual uh, problems, issues like, mm -hmm. you know, order coordination difficulties or social and communication and all the sensory processing and all. So how does the overall co-occurrence of dyspraxia and autism in children, um, how does that affect the overall development, ma'am? So especially like parents are very concerned about education or, you know, my child needs to have friends, needs to be, uh, needs to be very social. And when parents have that concern, so how does the co-occurrence affect the overall development of the child? The co-occurrence of these two is going to lead to more problems than each of them individually would. Uh, given that we are a country that focuses so much on education, uh, one of the key tasks that we have in education is writing. So in order to write, if I ask you to write, uh, Mirakin, can you do air writing? Yeah. Yeah. So if I ask you to do air writing, just, just write anything. Maybe just write your name. I have to write my name. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You notice how the spelling is not there. You haven't actually written the words, but you know exactly what you're going to do, how you're going to do. Your movements are very precise. You are able to keep it to that. You did not go beyond the screen. You knew where to stop. You knew how high to go. And all of this you're able to do because you have the motor planning abilities to do it. But it takes a lot of motor planning abilities for you to be able to lift your hand, hold it here, then make one standing line, then make a small of sleeping, not sleeping, oblique yeah. line, then another oblique line, then make another standing line, just for you to be able to plan that whole thing. Something that you and I take for granted because it seems very easy. It takes a lot of effort for a child who has distracted. So when they are having to learn how to break down each task and then to perform it, it's really strenuous to them. It takes a lot of mental uh, energy, if you will because that's what you're investing every time you need to think about what you're doing. So cognitively, you're inputting a lot more energy than you would otherwise. Now, along with this, there is the autism component. So that makes a child get frustrated, actually. We're trying to explain to you that, look, I can't do this. So these are children where the uh, skills may look like they're affected. The impairments may look like they're a problem there. But at the end of the day, it is all about how they're able to participate, which is going to be affected. So if writing a simple thing, writing something that you and I take for granted, you don't even have to think about it. You just start writing. When I said, can you do air writing? You just knew exactly what to do and you, have, you could do it. But a child who's having these issues takes a lot of effort, a lot of uh, energy to be able to perform each of these tasks. And then they end up getting tired. And when they are tired, when, when you are tired, what happens to you, Rajan? How do you feel? Want to do anything? You just stuck. 
you don't want to do anything. You start to get frustrated. Uh, if you were a small child, you probably might have a temper tantrum. Uh, but as you grow up, you know that having these temper tantrums doesn't help. I need to communicate to somebody that I am tired. A child on the autism spectrum is not able to do that. So what we end up seeing is a lot of behavior issues. A lot of issues that people will quickly say, oh, this is a child on the autism spectrum. This is what you can expect them to do. They're going to cry and they're going to be uh, angry and things like that. So the reason for that is because this child has spent a lot of energy and is probably very fatigued by the time you got to see him. So this makes it difficult for a child to be able to participate in tasks like education. And then socialization. Uh, when we started this conversation, the first thing you said was, hi, and you smiled. A child on the autism spectrum, to have to plan that, to say hi, to smile, and then to do it takes a lot of effort. Already they find it difficult because they don't know how you're going to respond. They don't understand, not understand, they don't know how you're going to be. So they don't know in response to you how they should be reacting. So that whole reciprocity itself is a problem. And then compound that with the fact that motor planning is a problem. So they don't know whether to say hi first, whether to shake hands first, whether to smile first, which one of these goes first, then the second, then the third, then the fourth. So having to plan all of that makes it very difficult for them. Uh, I've been reading about a, uh, about individuals on the autism spectrum who have said that you know they get so tired of trying to communicate that it's much simpler, that they just don't go out, even when they want. You can imagine how frustrating that must be for somebody who wants to go, who wants to interact, but finally decides it's too much, too much effort. Let them just not do it. That a lot of levels it is uh, causing them distress. So, so, uh, so when we started our about autism and also we have been studying that like in children with autism they usually do not have developmental delay. So uh, when children with autism and dyspraxia, do you think the developmental delay aspect comes because of the dyspraxic component or it can be because of any other neurological reason? So when a child is diagnosed with uh, autism, they would be ruling out all the other neurological issues, say CP or things like that. Uh, those would get ruled out at the beginning to make sure that you know the child gets the services he or she requires. But many of the children on the autism spectrum tend to have these delays, which are unexplained. They may not be very obvious delays, but they will be delays. Subtle delays in acquiring motor skills definitely exist, whether it's fine motor or gross motor. And one of the reasons for this usually is the dyspraxia component. That is, they're unable to coordinate uh, what they're supposed to do. Um, right. So we had this child we were working with. Uh, when she came to us, she was about three years of age. And she was not walking. She was walking with a very wide base of support and uh, with flat feet. Uh, had generalized hypotonia. So I actually looked like a child who was having a CP hypotony uh, with core strength, weakness, and all of that. Uh, as we kept working with her, we realized the whole idea of social communication was a problem. She would not give us eye contact. Uh, she would be very, very stereotypic in her communication. So she had learned one phrase that during therapy, if she wanted to get out of therapy, she knew she had to just say, I want to go to the loo. And then we would say that she has to go to the loo. And then she would repeat it over and over and over again. But that is all that she would say, not anything. She had difficulty with playing. Uh, she could not figure out how to play with different objects and what to do. Until we looked for these features, we would have actually classified her as being somebody with CP only and having CP hypotonia because she had all the classic signs of very low tone, poor abdominal muscles, fine motor issues. Uh, balance issues and the flat feet. All of this making it look like she's actually a child with CP. She also had a history uh, of, of birth asphyxia, which was what resulted in the delay in development. So all of this was there, but until we were able to actually pinpoint the fact that she had communication issues, she had this need for sameness, she had difficulties with transition, and she could not sleep. This child would not have been diagnosed with autism. But the child had a diagnosis of autism, and she had dyspraxia along with it. That was diagnosed much later, though. Okay. Yeah.
so now for the next uh, that is your uh, like you've answered a little bit for the next question in reference to the example of the child so uh, how does an accurate and a timely diagnosis you know help the intervention strategy so i am usually the kind of person that doesn't uh, rely a lot on like doesn't lay a lot of emphasis on diagnosis but i want a child to be diagnosed <laughs> in time to get therapy so in that sense i would be looking at what the problems are and trying to make sure that the diagnosis happens at the right time so that the child gets served many times i find parents don't want to get their child diagnosed and one of the reasons they tell us is once my child is diagnosed with a condition like autism you have no idea how he's going to get labeled so if i send my child to school with a diagnosis and i have to tell the teacher that my child has a diagnosis and then everything that goes wrong in the school is going to be blamed on my child my child is never going to be looked after is always going to be looked at differently and every problem is his problem is what is going to be thought of so i'd rather not get my child diagnosed in fact one of my uh, worst i mean this is one of my worst memories actually uh, for a child where we forced the parents to go for a diagnosis literally forced i have no other word for it uh, we tried to keep pushing them to go for a diagnosis and we lost the child to follow completely the family completely cut off from us uh, after a lot of work around this when i spoke to the grandmother uh, she said listen you want to label my child i don't want my grandchild to be labeled under any circumstances all you are doing is labeling them and you are going to cause problems for my child later so i'd rather that you don't get uh, into this and we don't think we want to continue with therapy unfortunately the child stopped coming for therapy stopped getting the services she required and then she came in a few years later again the same place where i was working uh, we found that her issues were very very significantly bad at that time when we spoke to the parents again about you know maybe a diagnosis is something that we need to go for they were still adamant just let's get up for therapy let's not go for a diagnosis we don't want a formal diagnosis we don't want any document which says that she is diagnosed with it and to me that was very hard breaking because until she is diagnosed she is not going to get the care she requires while as a professional i think a diagnosis is really something that needs to be done uh, we need to be destigmatizing these diagnoses in multiple ways so that we get parents to not think about the fact that they are children are going to be labeled and it's going to be bad rather they think about the fact that once a child is diagnosed he or she is going to get the services that they need so that is something that uh, we really need to work on uh, sometimes i have parents who want their children to be diagnosed and labeled when there are no issues and not at other times when there are significant issues parents don't want a child diagnosed and being able to make that uh, decision is a little difficult sometimes Uh, so we also face similar problems here and across yeah. initial consultation and so this is something i think it's a common thing all over that we face yeah. absolutely i think uh, as a organization you all are doing a lot of work about raising the awareness levels related to autism yes right? um, we try to do yeah yeah so i am hoping that helps <laughs> yeah. yeah so what are some of the myths or misconceptions that you know uh, the relationship between dyspraxia and autism and well, how would you like to address that so i think like uh, both you and i actually mentioned this uh, at some point uh, the whole idea that a child with autism should not have a motor deficit uh, was quite prominent for mm -hmm. the longest time and i'm glad to see that there has been a shift uh, while the research has already been in that direction translating it into regular practice has been challenging in some ways but i'm hoping that more and more people start to view things uh, as they are and put everything together on the other hand with dyspraxia again there are a lot lot of myths related to the fact that dyspraxia occurs only in individuals who have a high iq uh, that's not the case children with a lower iq may also have dyspraxia the whole idea is that they are unable to perform tasks which they should be able to perform at the cognitive levels that they have if they are still unable to do those tasks motor tasks especially then we need to think about dyspraxia as a diagnosis uh, as a professional for me both dyspraxia and autism are under diagnosis my thing 
autism is getting a lot more attention, so at least it's being diagnosed more, but uh, very little about uh, dyspraxia. I mean, the global percentage for dyspraxia, when I was reading some of the articles related to dyspraxia, the range goes from 5% to about 15% and sometimes even more. But in our country, that diagnosis is not that popular. So uh, I think we really need to start generating some awareness about that. But autism and dyspraxia coexisting is, uh, is definitely there. So how can you know, us professionals or parents, caregivers, or even educators you know, at the school level, so how can they support individuals who you know, they present characteristics of dyspraxia and autism? Because children with dyspraxia have different uh, problems and children with autism have different problems. But when they combine together, it becomes a whole lot different problem. Mm -hmm. So how can we help them, support them? So as a therapist, I like to think about work in a more broad manner than very narrow. So I don't think that uh, for a child's therapy outcomes to be successful, I can't focus only on the child. I would be focusing on things which are around the child. And uh, one of the models which is very popular in occupational therapy is the, the person environment occupation model. When you use that, I mean, it's easiest to explain for me. Uh, when you use that, we are thinking about the fact that for a child to be able to participate or live in society, he needs to have some skills, he needs to have some abilities, and the environment around him needs to be able to bring everything else together. So if as a group of people, when we're working with children with autism and dyslexia, we are able to get together and develop an environment which is supportive, which provides the right kind of scaffolds, the right kind of support that a child requires, the child's outcomes are always going to be way better than they would be otherwise. At this point in time, we are working with one child where uh, the mother has been noting issues related to autism. And we as therapists have been noting the issues related to dyspraxia. Just having that conversation with, uh, with her uh, to get her to see it in that manner you get it to see that the problems need not be only with what he is doing, rather the problem is everywhere. And we need to figure out solutions everywhere. That has been challenging. It doesn't always work out. Uh, many times, I mean, not in this particular case, but many times I come across parents will be like, yeah, here's my child, you fix my child, and you get my child back. It doesn't work that way. So just having this conversation with them about the fact that it's, at the end of the day, it's how they are, not who they are that matters. Like how they're able to perform, how they're members of society. That's what we need to look at. So I think working with multiple professionals together will definitely help. Uh, one of the steps that we really need to take is to advocate for the fact that dyspraxia exists in children with autism, getting other professionals to become aware of these issues so that we are able to put in strategies which will help everybody, not just one therapist and one child. So those sort of things I think would be really helpful to look at. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nam. Uh, what are so your thoughts about this, but miraculous? Sorry, yeah. what are your thoughts about this? Um, so, so yeah, we also see a lot of children with dyspraxia, and most of the time, again, like how you said, uh, sometimes we also overlook the concept of dyspraxia. So here at PlaySuite, we have a separate uh program for like we have a separate dyspraxia program that mm -hmm. we come up with. So it's a little intense of, you know, you have OT, uh, you have speech, you have PT. And along with that, we have uh, like either a session with co-regulation and we have something called an upbeat program. Mm -hmm. So you know how children do not always like to do exercises, but then when you combine it with music, so they, they are much more free, the movements mm -hmm. become a little free and fluid. So we have a program called upbeat. So we have a program that we have here that we give for children who we feel are you know, come under dyspraxia. Mm -hmm. So again, it is a whole lot of collaborative approach, but not just OT will help or not just speech will help. So again, we need physiotherapists also. So again, this is something that we are also promoting that you know physiotherapy is also required as part of a treatment plan here. Uh, so, 
Yeah, so again, working on their motor planning, I still remember your TV class where you put goal plan, do check, goal plan, do check. So that is something that I use here for children who are verbal and who are at the cognitive level to understand. So I try to do that with them so that they come up with uh, solutions, problem solving, mm -hmm. uh, and everything that we can do. And again, even for children with autism, uh, we will have to look into the uh, dyspraxia component also. And actually what I feel is that focusing on that has made a whole lot of difference. Mm -hmm. Because they are uh, able to do movements, new movements, or even like movements that are struggling to do a little better when we uh, focus on the dyspraxia component and work on that. So yeah, that is something that is not Good. Good to hear. Yeah. So, um, so with this, we come to the end of the question. So thank you so much, ma'am. On behalf of Play Street team, I would like to thank you, ma'am, for taking the time to share your insights and expertise today. So your perspective has added very valuable depth to our understanding of dyspraxia and autism. To our viewers, uh, I, we hope that you found this interview insightful. If you have any questions or if you would like to share your thoughts, Please, please uh, feel free to contact us. So at Play Street, like I've mentioned before, we offer a special program called the Dyspraxia Program, which uh, has an intensive occupational therapy, speech therapy, physiotherapy, upbeat, and co-regulation program. So if you ever feel that your child may have dyspraxia, please feel free to contact us for further details. Thank you, viewers, for being a part of this conversation. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you so much.